Welcome to the Mom as Well podcast, where we are digging deep into the gifts and the gaps of foster and adoptive parenting. I'm Tara Hutton, and I'm glad you're here. Mama's well. Yes, she is. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Mama's Well podcast. Um, I always say this, but I'm excited about our guest today. Um, and thinking about what we were going to talk about had me thinking of a couple weeks ago. If you've been reading my emails, you know um, we married off another son of ours. And so I spent the week in another city because they got married in another city. And as I was driving around town preparing, um, I noticed that there were a lot of these these tents like clustered together, like um, huge like cities of tents. And I asked about it and it was pretty obvious it was a, a large homeless population, but they were all over town. And um, I couldn't help as I would drive by each one of these these cities. Um, it was an unfamiliar place for me, so I was just watching and, and paying attention to my surroundings. But um, I would I was just left wondering and thinking about the people that live in those tents, and um, and what what they're doing and and what what their situations were and. Um, and so, and of course, that got to me thinking about foster care because that's always on my mind. And I remember reading over the years that like a huge um, population of our homeless and our prison, um, our prisons come from kids who have aged out of the foster care system. And, and that means that they've turned 18 and never established um, permanency. They've not been adopted. They've not been, they, they've not been grounded and and given a home a permanent home permanency and so then as as it would as things happen um I ran across something this week in my in in a book that I'm reading that I I want to share and so I'm going to try to read it as best I can without my glasses um it's about compassion one of my favorite words one of my favorite things compassion asks us to go where it hurts, to enter places of pain, to share in brokenness, fear, confusion, and anguish. Compassion challenges us to cry out with those in misery, to mourn with those who are lonely, to weep with those in tears. Compassion requires us to be weak with the weak, vulnerable with the vulnerable, and powerless with the powerless. Compassion means full immersion into the condition of being human. And that's by uh, Donald McNeil, Douglas Morrison, and Henry, Henry Nowen. And that like just hit me because that's, that's what I want. That's who I want to be. And it, that's painful at times. If you've ever been in, in been yourself in pain or struggle um, or set with someone and been able to really be there, it's powerful. And my guest today um, has done that, and she does that. And she, she, as this says, she enters into places of pain. Um, she shares in brokenness, and um, she cries and weeps with those who are. And she did that um, for a lot of people, but one in particular. And when I heard the story, I couldn't wait to beg her to come on the show and tell us about it. But um, let me, I want to make sure that I introduce her correctly, but um, today's guest is Dr. Bonnie Hubert. Dr. Hubert is a former high school guidance counselor. She is a current life coach, national trainer with the Why Try, I love that, I want to know more about that, and Resilience for Youth programs, as well as a mother of four. Welcome, Dr. Thank Hubert. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I'm glad that you were able to do it, and just so happens that you live in my neck of the woods. How's yes. that? 10 minutes. I know. And I was here. Yeah, was wonderful. that's great. Um, so you have an incredible story. And, you know, I want the whole world to hear it. And um, but let's just take it off in little bite sizes. So tell tell start where you want with with who you are, your family, whatever. Just give us a little snippet into your life and um, go for it. You okay. get started. 
Well, my husband and I, my husband's name is Skeeter. Okay. So great Texas name, yeah. South Texas boy. And um, we were both students at Sam Houston State University, graduated from there and just kind of migrated south okay. a little bit, a little bit yeah. and put our roots down here 24 years ago. Okay. And um, I began as a, an elementary school teacher a bilingual elementary school teacher at B.B. Rice Elementary, mm -hmm. and then um, went back to school and eventually got my master's degree in counseling. And um, w when it, I was at a, two other elementaries, and then um, when I got my licensure to be a professional counselor, I uh, interviewed for a position at, as the crisis intervention specialist for Conroe ISD, mm -hmm. and I spent five years there. And over that time. Um, I also had children mm -hmm. of my own. Um, Skeeter and I have three biological children mm -hmm. and one adopted daughter. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were raising our family here and, and doing life. And um, we always felt compassion, mm -hmm. as you're describing, right? For for children, um, I would tell my husband stories about the children that I worked with in the schools or, um, you know, in my private counseling practice. Mm -hmm. um, I would ju just lament that yeah. I couldn't do more, you know, right. that, that these children had to suffer as they did. And I, I've worked, I had worked with hundreds of kids Mm -hmm. And always felt like there was one more for us, right? At that time, mm -hmm. having three biological, I thought we would have another baby. Oh, okay. And um, it was kind of that time where we were praying about it and we were asking God to give us some clarification. We both felt this tug that um, I was working as a high school counselor at Conroe High School. This was about 2012, mm -hmm. 2013. Mm -hmm. And um, our prayer was answered in a way that neither one of us expected. Okay. And so, um, that's when my daughter Serenity, um, was born into our lives. So in our family, we kind of joke about it. We say that she's actually the youngest, even though she's really the oldest. Okay. So when she came into our lives, my daughter, my oldest biological daughter was 12. Okay. And, um, and so in, in the way we talk about it in our family, Serenity is actually the youngest. Olivia is still the oldest. And so... Um, you don't want to mess up that birth order. Yeah, yeah, the birth order. <laughs> so um, I met Serenity when a student of mine came to me and said that she had a friend she was really worried about and that needed help immediately. Mm -hmm. And so I turned. it turns out that Serenity was actually my student too. It was the beginning of the school year and it was my first year mm -hmm. at Conroe High School. So I, okay. I was very new. I didn't really know my students yet. Um, she jokes with me. She says that I actually met her before that. It was to come and tell her that she couldn't have a schedule change oh. that she wanted. <laughs> and she didn't like me very much at yeah, that point because like she was a little no. irritated right. about that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, her friend brought her to to my office and she started to make an outcry mm -hmm. for her situation, which was very dire. And, and I knew that immediately when yeah. I spoke with her. She said that she was living at the Motel 6 with a, another family. There were probably six or seven people in that hotel room mm -hmm. um, that her mom was tweaked out on meth and um, Vicodin and cocaine and that uh, she told her that day that they were going to be moving from the hotel to move in with three men. She was yeah. very scared. Mm -hmm. And she had reached out to her, her, her friend and then, of course, her friend's mom. And so they actually already had made an, a, a CPS report oh. on the same day that I did. Okay. So um, within 24 hours, she was picked up from the they, – they actually went to the hotel, um, the – they saw the condition that her mom was in and they immediately removed her and they placed her in the Bridgeway Youth Shelter. Mm. So all of that happened really kind of unbeknownst to me. Um, and then a couple of days later, she came back to school and I saw her, she came to my office and she kind of filled me in on everything that had happened. And from that- Hold on, was she angry with you? No. Okay, so no, she wasn't she was angry. absolutely okay. relieved. Oh, she was it. scared. Yeah. Um, her story is that like when I met her, she had left California, which is where she was 
where she was born and kind of grew up mm-hmm. the majority of her life. And she had moved to Oregon, then Colorado, then Texas, living down um, in the Gulf Coast mm-hmm. area. Uh, or uh, yeah. I think it was... Like Corpus or something? No, or? higher than that. Okay. Baytown or oh, okay, something okay. like that. She'll mm-hmm. have to yeah. correct me on that. I'm, I'm misremembering. But anyway, then they ended up up here in Conroe. And, okay. and this was the place where she had spent the most time. She had moved 16 times. Wow. In the four years from 10 till, till I met her wow. at 14. And I met her just before her 15th birthday. Wow. And she wanted nothing more than to just be in the same place. She loved mm-hmm. Conroe High School. Mm-hmm. She loved her teachers. She loved the administrators. Mm-hmm. She felt like that was the best place that she, she was had starting to like you. Been. Well, I think <laughs> at that point, you know, um, I, she did I come just come back to your office. She did come yeah. back. Yes. And I will say that I've worked with hundreds of kids over the years from little kids Mm -hmm. to, um, you know, teenagers Mm -hmm. all the way through seniors in high school. And I've always felt like I wanted to take a couple of them home, (laughs) you know, like, Mm -hmm. oh, I just, you know, but it's not our role as educators and counselors. But um, with this young woman, I can tell you that um, God spoke to me from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. When she would walk into my office, I, I would get chills, like literal chills from the top of my head down to my toes. Hmm. Um, I felt very strongly that I was going to be more involved in her life hmm. than just being a counselor for her. But I didn't speak that to anyone. It was hmm. just an impression that I had. Mm-hmm. And I almost tested it. Like when mm-hmm. she would walk in my, my office, mm-hmm. I would be like, okay, okay, God, are you mm-hmm. going to give me those chills again? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I... I I'm just going to see if this is real or if it's just in my head. And sure enough, she would sit down. And I remember I had this one particular um, image of her. She sat down in a chair, and I was kind of sitting where you are across the table. And I had a bookshelf behind me. And there was a picture of all of our family, Mm -hmm. our animals, and things like that. And I just remember her talking to me and then just looking over at the bookshelf Mm -hmm. and just like gazing over there almost just longingly. And there it was again, the chills yeah. again. Yeah. So anyway, um, I didn't really act on that, those feelings at that time. Uh, I, I kept talking with Serenity. If I had, you know, we had the same lunch, like I had lunch duty mm-hmm. and she was in that lunch. So she would come up and talk to me and I'd just ask her how she was doing, how, how the youth shelter was, mm-hmm. which, you know, surprisingly she felt pretty comfortable there. Mm-hmm. Um, she would kind of update me on what was happening with her mom. And she, she was there for the full three months. Mm-hmm. And so oh, you mean that, is that how long yeah, you're allowed they, to stay they there? Were, they only or? allow them at that time. I don't know how okay. it is now, but it was essentially 90 days. Oh, okay, okay. And then they had to find a placement for oh, them. Okay. Okay. And so she was during that whole time, they were doing all of the things that they do mm-hmm. um, with working with CPS and getting her, um, evaluated Mm -hmm. psychologically Mm -hmm. and taking her to a counselor, Mm -hmm. checking out her health and medical Mm -hmm. needs, Mm -hmm. dental needs, all of that stuff. So it was very just kind of surface level stuff, but Mm -hmm. I, I was just trying to keep in touch with her. Mm -hmm. Um, her friend actually wanted, the mother wanted, um, to bring her into their home and they were pursuing that. Um, but unfortunately her friend tested positive for marijuana. Uh. And when that happened, that, halted that and allowed and then put her back you know to Mm -hmm. square one they started to look for um placements that would accept a teenage girl Mm -hmm. and unfortunately they're just not they're few and far between between. um so and when she was updating you on she's updating me i'm like yeah, you so know, no, CPS that, hadn't reached out to you uh, just mm-hmm. as, as, even as a guidance counselor or anything, not at that point? No, not, not, really. not okay. be, no, not really. Okay. Um, I started having these feelings that I wanted to become more involved with her when I learned that she had no other family okay. besides her mom. Her, um, her grandmother lived in, I think at the time it was Montana, she had no, her, she didn't know who her biological father was. She did have a, a stepdad that her mom was married to at one time that she, she spent up the most time mm-hmm. with in California. Mm-hmm. There was an uncle in Oregon, but no one. Mm-hmm. And so I just, again, that compassion, right? Mm-hmm. That, that feeling of this child is alone, like mm-hmm. completely alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, 
um, just kind of behind the scenes, I started asking her teachers about her, what they knew about her. And I remember one story, uh, an English teacher told me that um, it was, it was the, the spring prior, like mm -hmm. that last spring mm -hmm. before her sophomore year. And she, it was the days that, the day that they were going to take the star test, right? It's this mm -hmm. horrible oh, yeah. day for kids, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. they're, they're stressed anxiety. out. Yeah. They have this anxiety. They yeah. have to finish. And she said it was a portable building uh, she was in. It was the first period, and it was raining outside. And there was a knock on her door, and she was just about to start administering the test. Mm -hmm. And it was serenity, and she was drenched. And she said, you know, am I... Am I too late? Mm. Like, did I miss it? Yeah. I need to take that test. Yeah. Wow. And I was like, whoa. And so when I asked Serenity about that later, she told me that her mom didn't wake her up. You know, she was mm -hmm. passed out or something mm -hmm. like that. And she walked to school two miles from the apartment where they were staying in the, pouring in down the rain it. and got there late. To take the and test. And it was because she knew she, she shouldn't miss that test. And um, I had talked to a couple of other her teachers they really had no idea that mm -hmm. that she had any of these mm -hmm. this these issues going on she to me was a, an incredible example of resilience mm -hmm. um and from the very beginning you know she said that she she wanted a better life for herself than the one she had mm -hmm. the one that she had been living mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. long story short yeah. bringing it into where we actually got involved um I was I remember thinking, you know, she's completely alone. I wonder if we could just be mentors for her, mm -hmm. um, like get involved somehow, even go over to Bridgeway, play games with the youth, just yeah. something to where we could be a mentor for her, yeah. like a CASA is, yeah. like, a, right. like an advocate yeah. is, but more often. Yeah. And, um, and I had that feeling. And so I, I remember I went to a uh, choir concert for my Old, then, you know, yeah. oldest daughter, Olivia, we were sitting in the Methodist church in the woodlands, mm -hmm. listening to these uh, kiddos sing around Christmas time. And I was sitting there and tears just started rolling down my face. And my husband's looking over at me mm -hmm. and he's like, what's wrong with you? I mean, this is good music, but it's not yeah. like that good music, <laughs> you know? And I, I was, I was like, I just, I need to tell you something. Wow. You know, was this the felt, first time you had brought it up to him? Yeah. First time. Wow. I have to tell you something. I said, there's this kid, there's this girl. And I really feel like we need to become foster parents. And he's just like in, what? He's like, what? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> looking at me. And anyway, later, of course, I explained more. I told him the story yeah. and I said, would you be okay if we just looked into mentoring, mm -hmm. like mentoring this, this girl? And so after that, of course, I went through all the legal channels. I asked our legal department in Conroe ISD if that was something that I could do. And mm -hmm. she said, just go through CPS, you know, do yeah. everything through that. Right. And even though she's a student here, yeah. if you do all of that, yeah, then, that takes then the, you should be okay. the liability off of. Exactly. Yeah. So um, we went through all those channels and um, the, to become a mentor, just to, okay. to like take her, yeah. take her yeah. with us what to is hang that? out. What, what is, I mean, briefly, do you, do you remember what that was? Uh, that's uh, interesting. Like the channels to yeah, do that. Yeah, I didn't know I what, think what do you we, to do? we contacted the caseworker. Okay. We, and we said that we were interested in, I can't remember if that was when they, they did a fictive kinship kind of de designation okay. that allowed us to, to, okay. to, to be that way, okay. which we, you know, the relationship as the school counselor kind Helped. of gave that sure. fictive kinship. Yeah. There was already a relationship yeah. there. Um, and so anyway, they, they allowed us to come get her from the, the shelter and just kind of have a Saturday with our family. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. Mm -hmm. The first day, um, and we had gone to my son's football game and then to a restaurant, um, things like that. And, and we took her, we both went to take her home. And on the way back from the shelter, I just remember he had his hands on the wheel and I looked over and tears are just streaming down his face. And yeah. I think that God manifested that to him yeah. too. It touched his heart, yeah. what I had been feeling. Right. And so from that, there were no words, you know, it was just like, he said, okay, yeah. I, I know what you know, and yeah. we need to do whatever we're led oh, to wow. do. So we did, we continued to be uh, mentors for her. Her mother worked her plan, was given a, um, a 
goals to to achieve sure. to um, to achieve reunification, which is the goal mm-hmm. and what sure. we wanted also for yeah. Serenity. And so um, the next step for us was to become foster parents because she needed to pretty she quickly, needed to be right? placed. Yeah, she needed okay. to be placed, and we could have done a fictive kinship placement, which essentially that's what happened until we finished all of the things for foster yeah. to be licensed foster parents. Mm-hmm. But I, I felt really strongly that we needed to become licensed yeah, foster parents I would to agree truly, with that. even mm-hmm. though, you know, I've, I, I've had a lot of training and working with youth and adolescents. I really felt like for us to be a team and, mm-hmm. and really understand everything about what a foster child goes through mm-hmm. I, I, that we should go through. So mm-hmm. we went, with, we went through arrow ministries and mm-hmm. we became licensed foster parents okay. and that took s- several months. Yeah. I mean, I think we finally, we started maybe in January and finished in May. Got it. And during mm-hmm. that time she was able to live with us. And again, working toward reunification, mm-hmm. um, was the goal. Right. And our goal was mainly to just allow her to see things maybe that she had not seen before, mm-hmm. experience how, um, a somewhat normal, <laughs> you yeah. know, healthy family yeah. works and to just experience some things mm-hmm. that she maybe had not experienced before to plant some seeds and to give her some strategies yeah. for how she might be able to, um, you, you know, maybe take some of what we were showing her and put it in her own yeah. life when she was able to be back yeah. with her mom. You know, I think of this phrase, it's, it's coming up in my head right now. It's like, you can't, and you can, you can do this on the positive and the negative, but you can't unsee what you've seen, right? So sometimes we use that in a phrase, like if you see something, you know, just devastating, like you can't unsee can't it, right? It. it shifts you. The same is true. Like if you've never seen something other than, you know, the inside of a Motel 6 with, with people who are high or you, you know, or... You know what I'm saying? If you've yeah. never seen something different, like you should invited her in to see something different. And yeah. she can never unsee that. It's and always what's there. interesting, too, is she did have a really good childhood until her mom became addicted to prescription pills. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So she grew up in this Oakdale, California, mm-hmm. and she her mom was there with her stepdad. Mm-hmm. She had a brother. They lived all together. And, and, and her mom, you know, had an accident that... Uh, that hurt her back and neck and she began to take prescription it's pills yeah. and then added alcohol yeah. and then it just led progressed. to it yeah. progressed. And so during the first five years of her life, yeah, she, good. she was a happy so kid. She had seen She it. had seen, she yeah. had experienced love and, and attention. Yeah. And, um, it wasn't until after she was five that things really Bless started. Her mom's heart, bad. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Nobody wants that. <laughs> no. That's for sure. So, okay, so you, I interrupted you, <clears throat> but you were just saying you, you brought her into your home. Y'all were getting licensed. Yeah. I think that's where you left. And her. our goal was really just to, to give her, to plant seeds, to help her ha- yeah. learn the, the how for her what and why in yeah. life. Yeah. And, um, and you had mentioned why try. Um, I actually, we actually used the visual analogies that are in that why try program, and we did it as a whole family. Um, Mm -hmm. every couple weeks I would pull out one of the visual analogies and each one has a theme, you know, I have, I don't, I mentioned it because that you, you know, I just read that you were an an international trainer. I think you said national national, national, okay. National Mm -hmm. trainer, well trainer. And, but I don't know anything about it. So tell us what it is. What is why? So I first found, I uh, love the name. Why try? Yeah. That's and it answers the the, the curriculum. the, The program really does help kids and youth, adults, whoever it is answer the question, why try? Mm -hmm. You know, why try in life? Why Mm -hmm. try in relationships? Why try Mm -hmm. in anything that you do? And, um, essentially it's, it's a program that, that teaches resilience Mm -hmm. and understanding your, your why. And then it kind of gives the how, how Mm -hmm. do you rise above what you're doing? So for example, one of the the first visual analogies I start with is, is a roller coaster. And the roller coaster has, you know, ups, highs and lows, ups and downs. But then it has this other track that's next to it that goes really high and then crashes and goes back to the beginning. And so the whole, the whole um, message of that visual analogy mm-hmm. is that the choices, the choices I make have consequences that are going to directly impact my future. Mm-hmm. And so 
we took, um, you know, I took my husband and I took that visual analogy and we taught it to our kids. And then it, you you put it with fun, you know, interactive yeah. games that that kids yeah. um, and youth will think are cool, you mm -hmm. know, object lessons or a video or something like yeah. that. And then teaching and discussing discussing these things. So yeah. there's actually nine visual analogies, and we went through them all. So mm -hmm. my goal was that, and, and it's also, you know, why try, I actually found when I was a crisis intervention counselor mm -hmm. for Conroe ISD, um, I went to a workshop, they talked about it and I brought it back to Conroe and said, we need this in every school, mm -hmm. like every guidance counselor mm -hmm. needs this. And, and it can teach mm -hmm. these, these kids that are mm -hmm. struggling and over uh, the three to five years that that I was the crisis intervention counselor, um, it took between three and five years. We actually brought it in, trained all guidance counselors and um, awesome. lots of administrators yeah. and special education teachers. And even, I mean, this was like 12 years ago. Yeah. And I, I think that Denise Apola, who is the guidance counselor uh, or the, the head over guidance and counseling in CISD, she did a, she did a a poll, you know, she just mm -hmm. kind of polled all of the counselors. And I think it was like, at the time, 51 out of 60 schools, counselors wow. were still using, using that it. curriculum with kids. And yeah. so that was kind of what we decided to, to, to go. Teach. Yeah, that's, and, yeah, you know, I'm thinking of it, because why try? I mean, what's at the root of that is powerlessness. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and that is definitely at the core of so many of kids. Um, with chaotic backgrounds and who've experienced such trauma is like, they, they feel powerless. Um, I wish I knew the statistics of, you know, kids in care receive, in, in the state of Texas, they receive their um, college tuition and fees. Well, I think it's, I, I mean, you may know this, you're the guidance counselor, you might know this exact number, but I'm, I'm thinking, is it two to 3% of them use it? Yes. It's probably less than that. It's, mm -hmm. it's, below 3%. Yeah. So mm -hmm. why try, right? Why try? I have, I'm, I'm, I've, they, they extreme powerlessness. And I think that's exactly what you're trying to teach, right? That exactly. You, yeah. That you can't, you have the ability to Rise learn above. and take those steps that you yeah. need to take. And I mean, um, the founder of Why Try, his name is Christian Moore, and he mm -hmm. wrote a book called The Resilience Breakthrough. And he really defines resilience as doing what you what you have to do mm -hmm. when you have every right not to do yeah. it, but you yeah. do it anyway. You, yeah. You push through and you fight yeah. on and you do it anyway. And I truly believe that without a vision, without being mm -hmm. able to see past mm -hmm. what's in their, their mm -hmm. current circumstances, mm -hmm they they don't have the the ability to fight for yeah. anything else because yeah. really they don't know it's there they don't know how to access it right so um during that time with serenity while she was in care we just that was our goal plant those seeds mm -hmm. help her to understand how she can when she gets back mm -hmm. and she goes back with her mom how to be able to to really have a different outcome in her life Mm -hmm. And uh, so we moved forward with that. We became licensed foster parents um, and knowing that she would have all of those those wonderful benefits that they mm -hmm. give to kids in foster care. Yeah. Um, the yeah, tuition, that's what I would say. That's the, the ETV it, program right? when they, 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 they now what's they the ETV program? It's, I, I think it's called education and training voucher. Okay. And so that education and training voucher is an addition on, an addition to tuition. Oh, okay. so it pays for a computer if they need it. Um, oh. it pays for a car payment, car insurance, like any how do you kinds get that? of, we're going to need to know how to do that. Yes. Yeah. Any kind of extra thing mm -hmm. up to a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly. Cause it's been a while since she, she accessed it, but mm -hmm. I, I want to say it was up to $5,000 during mm -hmm. the, the course of the college. four years of yeah. college. That's great. And of course, you know, you had to show what you were going to use it for yeah. and turn in a bunch of paperwork, but she did that yeah. and she accessed that along the way. Yeah. Um, so uh, we got to about nine months. She was with us and, um, her mom unfortunately was just didn't want to have to be accountable to anyone. She mm -hmm. decided that she wanted to pursue a relationship who, with someone who used drugs, mm -hmm. which was a clue to us that she was going to fall back into yeah. that, even though she had made really good ground. Mm -hmm. 
Um, then she started testing positive for um, drugs when they tested her. Mm -hmm. And um, we were moving. She was still able to see her mom and, and meet with her mom under supervised visits. And we were moving to the point where she could um, actually get visitation, like regular mm -hmm. visitation unsupervised mm -hmm. with her mom. Mm -hmm. And was Serenity wanting to do that? Was she? She was. She was. Yeah. She was absolutely. Yeah. She wanted that. And if she got that, that meant her mom was clean, yeah. and that's what she wanted more than anything. She wanted mm -hmm. her mom to get clean, to to be accountable, mm -hmm. to do the things that she needed to do, mm -hmm. so that she could have her daughter back. Of course. Um, and then we got to a meeting where we thought we were discussing all of that, and her mom surprised everyone in the room and said, "Today, I'm relinquishing my rights." And we were, you know, our hearts just sunk, sunk. And, and, um, it was a hard, hard thing. You know, we, we, Skeeter and I were looking at each other like, okay, well, what does this mean for us? Mm -hmm. Serenity was not in that meeting. Thankfully, mm -hmm. actually she was not there. Um, and then her biological mom asked if she could speak with Skeeter and I privately. Mm -hmm. And we sat in a room with her and listened to her as she poured her heart out. Mm. And she said, um, this is the hardest decision I've ever made, but I am doing this for the benefit of my daughter. Mm. Beautiful. And she's going to hate me. I know that. But will you please, will you please continue to care for my daughter? Mm. And this is a plea from a mom yeah. that... You know, yeah. again, going back to your, your yeah. paragraph about yeah. compassion, yeah. Totally. just like part of me wanted to scream out, no, yeah. no, you need to get yourself together because no, you're the right. best person for her. Yeah. You need to bring this up. But then the compassion part of me looked on her and, 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 and just, I loved her in that moment yeah, because course. that was, to me, it was very selfless. Yeah. And I told Serenity, someday you're going to appreciate the sacrifice mm -hmm. that she made. You may not mm -hmm. agree with it. Mm -hmm. You may not love her for it, mm -hmm. but you might as a mother appreciate yeah. where she was and mm -hmm. what she wanted for you. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't even, I don't know if she's there yet yeah. <laughs> still. Yeah. But, um, but that's the way I saw it. Mm -hmm. And I promised her that I would keep in contact with her mm -hmm. and that I would always let her know how Serenity is mm -hmm. and what she's doing in her life. And, um, and wow. that we would, we would do it, yeah. you know, like we would do whatever we could as long as that's what Serenity wanted. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. And was there an adoption at that point? No, or actually, there was quite a bit more to go oh. <laughs> after that. It wasn't that well, as easy. We don't have to go that way. But, you know, essentially, uh, over the course of another um, six months, okay. we had to, you know, Serenity, had we had a circle of care meeting. Yeah. She had to decide if that's what she wanted, okay. permanency mm -hmm. with us, what type of permanency, whether mm -hmm. it was PMC, permanent yeah. managing conservatorship, yes, or if it was adoption. Yeah. And ultimately, she decided... Permanent managing conservatorship. Okay. And she was and how old at that time? At that time, she was still 15. Okay. Still 15. Right. She turned 16 in October, and then everything was kind of finalized okay. around that, like yeah. January of, of that so year. So when you have, I, I know a bit about PMC, but what that meant, PMC went to you or to the department? So the department had... PMC yeah, and, and they, they would transfer, transfer it, it they to transferred you. it okay. over to us. Um, okay. So does that do you cut ties with the department at that point? Mm -hmm. Okay. Got yeah. It. Absolutely. Okay. Which is a good thing because, you know, it mm -hmm. sometimes as a foster parent and maybe other people can relate to this, you yeah. feel like you're a little bit inhibited in just being who you want to be as a full parent For because sure. CPS still has a say, the yeah. caseworkers and the CASAs and the, you know, the child can always run to their caseworker yeah. if they don't agree yeah. with what you are, yeah. are wanting yeah. them to do. And, mm -hmm. and so, and there were definitely moments like yeah. that, definitely yeah. moments where we thought she was going to leave because she didn't want to do what we were asking yeah. in our family or what we required. Yeah. And, um, and I think we got close a couple of times, mm -hmm. but we had an amazing CASA worker. Yeah. Oh, that's um, right. 
and Linda Chilcote, who okay. is still is works for Casa yeah. like in a professional role now, and still keeps in touch with Serenity. Wow. Uh, but eventually, she you know came around. It was difficult. You know, she mm -hmm. still spoke with her mom um, frequently mm -hmm. until you know like maybe six or eight months after that, mm -hmm. she felt like she needed to break ties with her completely mm -hmm. until she became healthy, mm -hmm. healthier. Yeah. Um, it wasn't serving serenity to speak with her mom. It yeah. really brought her to a bad place. Yeah. So, um, that's kind of where we yeah. were and it was still a long time before serenity truly like the walls came down. Yeah. Truly believed that that she could be a part of our family. Well, I'm super excited about this because I asked you when I heard this story, um, I said, um, and I, I know that you, you and Serenity talked about you doing this podcast and that she gave you consent and permission to Absolutely. talk about all this. Yeah. Um, but um, moms have one story and daughters have another story. <laughs> and so I, or a, a different perspective, different I should perspective, say. Yeah. yeah. And so I have been in touch with Serenity. Oh. We are having dinner tomorrow night, and um, she's going to join join me as a guest uh, after you oh, uh, next wow. week. Yeah. So yeah. I'm really excited to hear. You know, um, and I and I, and we talked, and it's very it's very um, vulnerable. It's yeah. I feel exposed every time I sit here, and I um, I'm not always sharing about you know as deep of places I have shared deeply and it's um it's it's hard and um and you talked about when you talk about resilience I think I was thinking of um it's Brene Brown I think that says uh you know lean into discomfort and we do hard things and 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 phrases like that and to me sitting here first of all allowing her giving you permission to talk about this and then her being willing to come and share about it is a huge sign that you have helped her in the resilience process. Well, one thing that I truly believe about her and about us all really is that we're we're all resilient, right? Kids in foster care are resilient. They're probably some of the most resilient, mm -hmm. but there are some different mm -hmm. sources of resilience yeah. that, that are in us all, right? Yeah. So I may be like severe like extremely resilient when it comes to relationships mm -hmm. but I might be lacking when it comes to the the resilience I would need for rock bottom moments mm -hmm. right whereas serenity had many rock bottom moments where she's like I know how to handle this yeah right but when it comes to relationships yeah so many people in and out of her life yeah. so many different times yeah, she yeah, was yeah. let down so many times mm -hmm. she called someone dad and mm -hmm. then he went away mm -hmm. so many times that mm -hmm. you know she moved after she had made connections mm -hmm. the resilience in that area might be lower for her sure so for her relationship is low rock bottom is high yeah for me relationships high resource resilience is another one like being able to use all of the resources around you to rise above wh what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. I, I found that she was very low or low in resource resilience. Mm -hmm. She would think, okay, well, if it's not right here in front of me, yeah. then it can't happen. Yeah. Instead Again, of that comes on that powerless place. Yes. Instead yeah. of what do I have? What tools can I use? Who, including people, things yeah. like yeah. everything around me, what can I use to, to overcome this moment that I'm in right yeah. now, you know? And then the other one, and this is, this is all from Christian's book, Resilience okay. Breakthrough. The other one he talks about is, um, street resilience. Oh, I bet she's high and so, in that. Yeah, <laughs> My so little eight year old daughter's I, high in that. <laughs> yeah. And, and you no, know, it's whenever I heard street resilience, I thought, okay, well, is that like living out on the street, that kind mm -hmm. of resilience? But really what it is, it's kind of like, you know, when you're oppressed, when someone tells you, you can't do something, uh -huh. when you, when you have, all these voices saying that it's not possible. Street resilience is really like, oh yeah, well, I'm gonna show you. Yeah. You just watch me. Yeah. You know, you I, just my watch. Daughter got I'm gonna that. dig in and I, you yeah. just wait. If somebody goes across the monkey bars. I remember this, her little cousins, 
she had never gone across the monkey bars. She saw them do it, and I could see her wheels turn, and she's like, oh, if they can do that, so can I. Yeah. And there she goes. Absolutely. Not only did she go across this way, she turned around and went back. When they make up their minds, yeah. they're going to do something, yeah. you just get out of the way because yeah. it's going to happen, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And so I think, you know, if we can help our youth, especially youth in foster care, yeah to increase their, their levels of resilience mm -hmm. in those four areas, they will be unstoppable. Okay, so let's go over the four areas. I heard the last one we talked First about. First one is relational. Relational, relational okay. resilience, okay. right? Um, that is, essentially is, I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do because I love this person, or that person's mm -hmm. counting on me, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna rise above and I'm gonna do this, even if I don't feel like it. Okay. Um, the second one is resource resilience. Okay. So essentially that is being able to look around you and draw from all of the resources around you, which even include potential resources, mm -hmm. being able to see things as potential resources mm -hmm. that you can use in yeah. your life. Yeah. Um, is it's huge to increase um, resilience. I thought I had a thought when you were saying that, um, kind of reminded me, uh, well, asking asking that would rec that would kind of fall into the place of like uh, ha being able to ask for what you need absolutely yeah i bet that's that's hard mm -hmm. because um i remember this is another sweet my sweet baby girl who rhymes with serenity she's trinity trinity um she used to say when she first started you know she first start, came to our home she would look at something and she'd say like if she wanted to look at my phone or whatever she'd be i like your phone you know or she might say I like that book, you know, but she wouldn't yeah. want to say, may I have that book or may I look at that book? She'd just say, I like it. Yes. <laughs> I'd be like, would you, would you like to ask for it? You know, yeah. and it probably is in that same genre, right? When they're younger, like basically I have all these things, but do I have the power to, to ask or to, do I have even the, what's that word? Um, do I deserve even mm. maybe, you know? Well, and, and I'm just thinking of that too. It's like, I don't know about your girls, but there are some kids that I, I've worked with um, that they have to do hard things to get the resources they need. Mm. So, for example, Serenity was taught to steal. Mm. She was taken to stores and, mm -hmm. say, and, and, and taught to steal for the basic necessities, mm -hmm. a brush, toothpaste. Right. Um, Understandable. Uh, you know, feminine products. Like yeah. She was taught to steal from one store and take it back to another store to get mm -hmm. what she needed, mm -hmm. right? So there's a difference. Like being resource resilient doesn't mean doing whatever it takes sure. at whatever cost to get what you need, right? especially if it's illegal, yeah. right? How can you access those resources? And, and part of it is finding yeah. a voice to yeah. be able to, to, ask to ask for what you need. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. that's good, finding a voice. Okay, yeah. so we have street resilience, we have relationship resilience, resilience we have um resource resilience we have street resilience street resilience and what was the yeah. other one and the last one's rock bottom resilience oh, rock bottom resilience. so street and rock bottom you know again just kind of that street is like oh yeah i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it yeah. even if you say i can or even yeah. if you're oppressing me and saying you know yeah. you, you don't deserve it then yeah. it's kind of that idea of yes i do the fight the fight yeah. yeah absolutely and and truly street resilience it's it's kind of like um, well, Christian he 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 actually has a song that oh, okay. that it's got this um, the lyrics are of this train that's trying to go up a mountain, mm. but every time it starts to go up, it mm -hmm. backslides because it's the little engine the that could yeah, is that what it is like kind of, <laughs> but what happens is that th th that this train in the song uses the weight of the load to to um, fire the engine okay to create momentum so that it can get up the mountain mm -hmm. that it's going up mm -hmm. and so it's kind of that with street resilience mm -hmm. is you take that heavy stuff and you use that as mm -hmm. fuel yeah to to yeah. get what you want to yeah. move forward to accomplish yeah. great things that's mm -hmm. what street resilience is mm -hmm. all about yeah and then the last one is rock bottom resilience and essentially that's kind of like you know when you're at your lowest point, you you look for hope. You reach for hope mm. and know that 
things can get better. That even if you don't, if you can't see it right now in this moment, mm -hmm. that you don't give up. Mm -hmm. That you know if you just keep trying, things will get better. Yeah. And that rock, that's why yeah. I think a lot of our foster kids have rock bottom resilience because yeah. they're, as long as they're alive, they're trying, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so those four sources yeah. of resilience yeah. are, are just so key. And that's why I'm so passionate about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, especially teaching kids that they don't have those models in their mm -hmm. lives yeah. um, for, for that type of belief yeah. system or behavior to understand how to get through hard things. Yeah. So. Yeah, resilience. Yeah. And I've often wondered, why is it that the same, you know, two, two people, not even necessarily kids, but just two people have gone through, maybe they're separate horrible things, or maybe they're the same horrible yeah. thing. It even doesn't really matter. Even the same family sometimes. Same families, right? Yeah. But you have this one person, this one of them that just rises up and just says, you know, they give the finger, they give the middle yeah. finger to all that. And they yeah. say, I'm doing this anyway. Right. Yeah. And then the other one just stays in, in that victimhood, you know, stays in that place. And I, I was thinking, I've been thinking about victimhood a lot lately because I, I can struggle with that. And, um, my, my favorite, my favorite 90, she's 93 now. Um, I talk about her often, but, uh, Hungarian Holocaust survivor, Dr. Edith Egger, mm -hmm. she says a, a, the, she talks about the prison of victimhood and she says a, a victim asks, why me? A survivor says, what next? Ooh, and I, I love, I love that, that line. Yeah. And, That's um, it. but that is, I that just is. don't know what is what is the switch? It's what resilience. What is the switch? It's I, resilience. Yeah, and I guess so, you just teach that. Well, and, you? and a lot of people, it used to be the, the, predom the predominant or the dominant thought on the issue was that resilience is just something that you were born with, right? You, it, mm -hmm. you could be born in a, a, a hut in Guatemala with a dirt yeah. floor and you were going to like just rise above, be yeah. that leader of that community someday. Yeah. But, um, now it's a little different, and you may f be familiar with Carol Dweck uh, and her work. She's a Stanford researcher, and, and her I know the, the key name. is it's mindset, yeah. right? Oh, mindset. yeah, 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 mindset. And okay. so Christian Moore, um, who wrote the book The Resilience Breakthrough, his work really aligns yeah. with her quite well, and it's the idea that, no, resilience can be taught. taught. Mm -hmm. It can be taught. Mm -hmm. You can, you can it's, it's a combination, mm -hmm. right? It is environment. It is kind of our innate mm -hmm. traits mm -hmm. that, that we are born mm -hmm. with as mm -hmm. individual spirits of God. But, yeah. um, but it also is something that kids can tough. learn. Yeah. And um, we can all learn. We yeah. can all increase yeah. in our resilience. Yeah. And so I, I want for all kids, whether they're in foster care or not, yeah. Right. If there's one thing besides love that I want my yeah. kids to have and be able to give and receive, it's resilience. Yeah. Well, I'll tell it. you what, you know what? I started this by thinking, like I said, I was thinking about the, the huge homeless popula population in, in these, the city that I was in and, um, and just thinking about, you know, you, you think about they, th those people have a story. And maybe they want to be there. I, I mean, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? But there's a story, right? And, and some of those people don't want to be there. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. But I just thought to myself, like, taking, looking and seeing a need, your heart fills with compassion. I mean, a lot of us look at, look at people. You know, you drive by them all the time, and they have a sign up, and my heart, my heart feels for them. But did I do anything? You know what I'm saying? Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. Um, but, but the, the thing about it is, is so we, we, we gotta become aware of that. And then, um, and then what is the action? And you guys took action and, and you shifted another person's life and, um, and tell us what Serenity is doing now a little bit. Don't tell much. You can't give too much okay. more of her story because and I know she's going to have a totally different, you know, perspective on this but just j just tell us what she does right now no don't get in details mama because they're gonna I will tell, tell us, you um so I, I'm a life coach uh -huh. and I okay, yeah. I I do you know I have on my 
my social media, I post a video every week and I talk about certain things. And this week I'm talking about the word extraordinary. And so I will tell you that serenity is extraordinary. Wow. She, she finished college and, um, she is now working for the Texas Department of Protective and Family Services oh, wow. as a conservatorship worker. So she truly has come around full circle. Yeah. You know, um, I just, she, she inspires me. It, and sometimes it's easy to forget how far she's come. Yeah. Like if she's yeah. irritating me or if yeah, she's, sure. you know, like being a daughter that yeah. is just like, I don't know, she doesn't call me enough or yeah. something, you know, yeah. just like that. And yeah. I'm like, oh. Yeah. But then I, I, I just have to think for a minute, if I just picture her the day I met her yeah, or on or, our journey that whole year yeah. before. Or sitting in yeah. your office, looking or at sitting, over your shoulder yeah. at that picture. And I, I see where beautiful. she is now, you know, yeah. like it's just unbelievable. It's extraordinary. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's what God did. Yeah. It, it's what was his plan for her. And I always remind her of that. I'm like, you were meant to do extraordinary things. Yeah. Like, that's awesome. That's just yeah. what I know she, she's meant for extraordinary things. And she yeah. already is like yeah. the story she's pouring back into kids that were like she is or yeah. like she was Yeah, that that was their story. And, you know, maybe she'll talk about this a little yeah. bit just about how that feels being yeah. on the we other talked side. talked about that a little on the phone. Yeah. yeah. But, um, she's wonderful at what she does. And I think she's been there for almost two years now. Yeah got the job right out of high of uh, college. Yeah. And yeah. will you close us out? You, you told me a little bit of, story. well, first of all, before I ask you to close us out with this little story, okay. how can people get a hold of you? You're a life coach. I'm sure you do that virtual. Everyone does everything virtual now. I know. Yes. So uh, I've I'm, actually been starting to do some face to face. I'm really excited good. about that. Well, it, just in case there's listeners yeah. all over the, all over the world. Hey, Seriously. All over the world. <laughs> yes. And, um, and so how can people get in touch with you? And then we'll make sure we put that in the show notes. Absolutely. Um, well, I, m the name of my business is um, One Way Life Coaching. Okay. And so my website is www.wedevelopyou.com slash Hubert. Okay. H-U-B-E-R-T. H-U-B-E-R-T. Okay. And then, um, of course, I'm on Facebook and okay. Instagram just have to look okay. one way life coaching with Bonnie Hubert. Okay. Yeah. And, um, okay. There was one more thing I wanted to ask you before I have you tell us that story. It was something about your, Oh, who do you work with? Like who, who are your typical clients? Well, I work with women. Okay. So eight, 18, I have a client that's 71 years old. Okay. So, you know, 18 yeah. to a hundred probably okay. women. So adults, and, and not adult children. women. Um, I work not with adolescents. I mean, I could, okay. uh, but my, but I really feel like it's, it's most effective when you have some autonomy, okay. right. And control of okay. what you're doing every day. Got it. Um, and, and the buy-in, mm -hmm. um, I, I had two, uh, college age clients this past fall okay. and I loved working with them. And so a, a range of people, I, I like to work with women that are maybe stuck, um, yeah. maybe stuck in fear or negative thinking that something's kind of stopping them from mm -hmm. doing what they dream about. Yeah. And, I can relate and, to that. Yeah. I'm 49. I just started this last there year. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> and it's, I don't it's, know if I was there's the so time, many but... amazing things women can do. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, that, that's what I do is help them to set those goals, to believe in themselves, to move forward and do amazing things, the things that they were destined to do, to their do. purpose yeah. in life. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank absolutely. you. Okay. So I want you to, um, close us out with this story you told me when we had our first initial conversation over the phone. Um, do you know where I'm going? Was it, um, kind of the culminating event with serenity? Well, when y'all were getting your, your nails, nails done. done. Yes. Yep. So during the entire time that we were, you know, learning about inviting Serenity into our home, and then when she started living with us, I always wanted her to call me something a little bit more informal. Did she call you Dr. Hubert? No. <laughs> At that time, I wasn't a doctor oh, okay. anyway. I hadn't, I didn't finish my doctorate till after that, but, um, but she would always call me Mrs. Hubert, and okay. it, it always just felt so 
formal. Sure. You know, it's almost like, yeah. can you call me like, call me uh, Mama Bear or <laughs> Mama Hubert yeah. or something like anything, you know, sure. and she wouldn't. She just, I, I think it was part of that wall that needed to be up at that yeah. time because um, she, she, um, well, I can't speak for her. My okay. interpretation is that she didn't want to disrespect her own mother mm -hmm. that was in her mm -hmm. life. Maybe and so, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, after all of that happened, this was um, her. She, here's another extraordinary thing about her. She also graduated at 16. She finished her junior and senior wow. years in one year. Um, so it was her, she was 16. It was her, we were getting ready for her to go to prom. And we were, my, my other daughter, Olivia, and, and uh, Serenity and I were all getting our nails done. Mm -hmm. And Serenity was sitting behind me. I was like this, you know, at a table getting my nails done. And she was sitting behind me getting her pedicure. And all of a sudden, I, I hear, Mom. And I, I thought, well, that didn't sound like Olivia. And I hear it again, Mom. And it was just like, like that day, you know, the first day when I felt those, those goosebumps. goosebumps just come over me. And I just immediately, like, started to cry. The lady that was doing my nails was kind of like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was like... Oh my gosh, you know, she just called me mom for the first time. Yeah. And I turned around and I said, are you, are you talking to me? Yeah. She said, yes, I am. And she's like, why are you crying? Wow. And it was like the, it was the thing that I had wanted more than anything for, for me, not just, you know, it could have been mama bear. It could have been, yes. it could have been mama Hubert. It didn't matter. Yeah. But when she said that to me, I felt like she knew that she was part of our family yeah. finally yeah and it was it was beautiful one of the most touching yeah. experiences in stick? my life yes yeah. it's so from that day on she's called your mom from that day on and and you know i mentioned that she did not we didn't do adoption we didn't okay. do that she kept her name her 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 uh, other name until about a year later and um, we had, we were sitting around the Christmas tree mm -hmm. and we had opened up all the presents and she said, I have one more for you and dad. And, um, it was a brown envelope. We opened it up and it was a letter with her new, um, name. And she had changed her name to Serenity Hubert. Wow. And so, of course, Christmas, Bonus. waterworks, yeah. everything. She had done it all her own. She had paid for it herself. She had gone to the courthouse herself. She had got, been really sneaky and had neighbors, like, help her out and, and wow. figure it all out. What and a, What a beautiful that, story. That was, yeah. like, that. Wow, was mom. It. Yeah. Mom as well. Mom as well. <laughs> That's mom right. Thank That's you right. for joining Absolutely. us. I, uh, I got to collect myself for a second. I was good. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you. I really, I, I can't wait to sit down with Serenity. Um, and the viewers, we tape this and this will be released next month, okay. but we'll put her right after you. Oh, okay. right. um, excellent. So you guys will tag team and um, they'll get to hear mama daughter story. And it was a beautiful one. Thank, thank you for you. sharing it. Absolutely. Um, thank you guys for, for staying the course and, and listening to this whole beautiful, beautiful story. And I hope you were moved. I hope you were inspired. I hope you, um, can just feel just a touch of, you know, the, the pain and the, the hurt that these kids go through. And then, and then just to remember that we all do have resilience. Like we are, we are resilient and we, it's our job and our role to, to remind ourselves of that so that we can remind our, our children of that. And so anyway, I hope you have a great, a great week. Um, don't forget to like the podcast. Let's see. I think it's like on YouTube. You like on YouTube you leave a review and a comment on your podcast platforms. Um, a let's see, what else is there? Um, 
Five stars. Five stars are great. I mean, who wants two stars when you can have five stars? I want five stars. And we um, we appreciate that because that gets the word out. It, it, it makes this podcast more available and more recognizable for a lot of other people. Share it. And um, we'll see you next week. Mama's well. Yes, she is. <laughs>